Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to the start of this course, which is cost control in the construction industry. I thought we'd start this course perhaps a, a little differently, given that it's online, and it's going to tie to a lot of aspects of advanced construction uh, management. So it means that we have to have a pretty good rooting in uh, the overall construction processes. Uh, but I thought I'd start out with just the aspect of change, change in general, and uh, how to learn more effectively. I think if we start with some online tips in that area, it'll be beneficial to you over the, the long run and to myself as well. Uh, we're all learning uh, new things as we go along. So I think if we can learn to do that more effectively, that will be helpful. And really at the root of cost control is learning from what's going on on your construction projects and being able to identify variances and changes and things that are outside your plan and being able to bring that back in and look at that, review it and see how you can make course corrections, but also how you can make changes to your systems uh, so that as a business you can improve, but also personally as an individual you can improve. So I think as you go through this course, I think it's going to pull a lot of different things together, as you'll see by the mind map uh, that we'll talk about in Lecture uh, 1B. Uh, and it's going to pull a lot of things together, and a lot of things need to work really well for us to effectively control our costs in construction projects, because the level of complexity is fairly high uh, in uh, large construction projects, let's just say. Okay, so let's um, get started. And, um, you know, the world is changing. I think we've been through a, a pretty uh, traumatic uh, year for many people in 2020. And we can see how quickly uh, things do uh, change in a number of ways. And one of the areas that I would also say that change is happening pretty rapidly and is how we get information and how we learn uh, from the traditional schooling systems that we've had in the past. Uh, so it's happening all around us. Uh, we can't slow it down. We can't stop it. It's been tried uh, in previous generations. If you want to look up Luddites and see how they tried to stop the advances of technology in the Industrial Revolution, uh, you kind of get the drift. It didn't work too well. Um, so I'm a bit nervous about change. I'm sure you're a bit nervous about change. And uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, the younger you are, probably the less nervous you are because you've kind of grown up in the middle of things really rapidly um, changing as we'll look at the next uh, few slides. Uh, but as you get to be a little bit better at things, you tend to get to be a little bit, a little bit more um, nervous or resistant to change, which, which can be highly problematic in today's um, society. Um, so... Really, I like to reframe things and look at things in a different way. And even though my initial thought from my perspective uh, might be that I'm a little bit resistant to change, I like to stop and reframe it and be more positive about it. Um, so that's one of the things that you can manage uh, with uh, the right set of uh, tools, uh, techniques, and mental models in your toolkit. And so when we think about um, change, I like this quote, management is efficiency in climbing the ladder of success. Leadership determines whether the ladder is leaning against the right wall. And I think one of the things too is, you know, if things are rapidly changing, well, what should we do about that? And the same thing goes with cost control when we talk about construction. There's going to be a lot of things that aren't going to go exactly the way you planned. And you're going to have to determine, well, what's the best uh, decisions to make in this stage in a project to try to recover that time, to recover that cost and get us back on track effectively. Because there might be some things that, yes, you could do, but it's not worth the time and effort and cost to do them. Uh, and there's other things that it may not seem like it's that big a deal, uh, but there's a ripple effect, second order, third order consequences to them. So, um, when we think about being resistant to change, these are some of the things that, that we think about. And, you know, people have worked very hard to climb the ladder of success in certain areas. So if you're, let's say, in your early 20s and you start to work in a construction company, uh, you might be working with somebody like around my age who's maybe a senior manager. And you might note that 
it's funny that they don't really like this or they don't they're resistant to adopting this uh, or they dump all this stuff on me who's in my early 20s and it's not really that surprising in the sense that uh, they've worked very hard to get where they are they've learned certain things that are of high value to those companies so they have certain experiences certain skill sets and it's going to take a lot of time and effort for them to learn some of these new things. So if they can delegate to that to somebody that's just starting out, uh, they would probably see some benefits in that. So if that's you, I would reframe your view on that and say, this is great because this gives me an opportunity to show what I can do with this new technology. And at the same time, you're going to pick up on that other individual's experiences as you grow in the construction industry. And so by the time you get to a more senior position, you'll have a better understanding of how the whole thing fits together um, that way. And when things are changing as you're getting into that position, you will have adopted skills that will allow you to be agile and adjust to those changes as, as you go through life. Uh, as opposed to just resisting everything and then you find yourself at a certain point maybe at an earlier age than you want, that you're redundant and you really don't have any utility or use for that particular company. And it's very difficult for you to retrain yourself because you haven't developed those skills, tools, techniques, mental models uh, throughout your life. Um, so these are some of the things that I'm trying to stress early on in this course, uh, because I think you'll see some of the opportunities and advantages to this way of thinking about goals, processes, systems, and putting in system controls to assist companies in uh, meeting their targets and bettering their targets and adding value to their clients while at the same time reducing or eliminating waste in construction. And so this is the way, uh, a good way of thinking about things. I don't know if you noticed it in this picture, but uh, take a good look. This is around 1908 in downtown Chicago. And um, what do you see in this picture, really? I know what I see, but maybe I'll give you a second. 1908. Looks like uh, downtown Toronto or downtown New York or do downtown Los Angeles at uh, rush hour. Um, a lot of activities going on, right? And uh, even busier than a lot of these cities at that time. Well, 1908 right we've got vehicular traffic we've got horse and buggies still uh, we've got street cars and what don't you see what don't you see in that image i'll give you a second to look at the image again what don't you see that today you would see in that intersection well if you looked carefully, you wouldn't see any traffic lights. So my understanding, traffic lights weren't widely available or installed until around 1913. So we had a lot of advances in technology and then we created a lot of problems and then we resolved a lot of those problems with other advances in technology. And so that's kind of what was going on back then. And uh, if we think about the, how fast things change and we go back through history, things took a long time to really sort of drastically change. Like a thousand years ago, it would take a hundred years or more for you to, you know, if you were in the 8th century or the 9th century, you're not going to see an appreciable difference in how people were living and operating. And some of the technologies, usually with military technologies and that, even those sometimes took... Um, upwards of a hundred years for those changes to take place. But by the latter part of the 1800s, the 19th century, you were getting heavily through the Industrial Revolution. This process started to dramatically speed up. Um, so the amount of change that was occurring was happening more rapidly. You know, you could have been born in the late 1800s and there would be no cars or vehicles of that nature that you would see around. I think uh, I'd have to double check, but I think it was late 1880s before uh, um, uh, the um, first cars were invented and really you didn't see them in any kind of volume. 
um, until the uh, early 1900s and mid-19, not mid-1900s, but like mid-1910, 12, 13, Ford with its Model T mass production uh, aspects uh, rolling off the line. Uh, but things were definitely ramping up. We had electricity, we had the light bulb, we had uh, a whole bunch of appliances that were coming on stream. So there's a lot of change happening in a short period of time, but it was still was still taking place um, over decades, right? Multiple decades. And really in the last 20, 25, uh, 30 years, that's really started to ramp up and speed up even more. Um, so we went from centuries of change for dramatic change to take place to decades. And now I can remember when the first student showed me their, their iPhone in class and um, I was uh, checking it out and looking at it. And so that was kind of a unique thing. My wife had a Blackberry before the iPhone. That was kind of nice, but still kind of businessy. And uh, to today where, you know, pretty much everybody, you look around, uh, people in restaurants, when we can go to restaurants, uh, people in classrooms and meetings and different things like that, everybody's staring at these electronic devices. And everybody has these electronic devices. Uh, it's become that these things are necessities, uh, at least in the developed world. And so that is a really dramatic change to have taken place in a matter of, I would say it was a matter of five to seven years when that, that took place. So rate of change of where you see something and it's on the outskirts and when it's actually happening is quite a rapid. Uh, and un not unlike uh, the street lights that I mentioned earlier, uh, Uber really, when it first started, I, I tended to, when I do a live class to ask uh, a class, how many students have used Uber, right? When we were, uh, when lead, uh, when lead certifications first came out and I do training with, in my consulting practice, I'd ask, uh, site supers and project managers, how many have you worked on a lead project? In the beginning on commercial uh, construction and condominium type construction, it was, um, you know, maybe one out of 30. And then after about three years, it was maybe uh, 15 out of 30. And then after about five years, it was, you know, 25 out of 30. So um, how rapidly that would change that certain things would become more um, systematic in our processes. Well, I'd ask students when Uber first came out, how many have taken an Uber? And I'd see two or three hands up. By about the third year, it would have been much better for me just to say who hasn't taken an Uber? And it would have been about two or three people or four people. I know myself uh, very quickly, because I travel a lot, uh, I would consider a city, is it an Uber city or is it a taxi city? If it's a taxi city, I know it's a pain in the neck to get around. If it's an Uber city, I'm gonna get there very, very quickly uh, and uh, very, very efficiently. And it came so fast that local governments didn't know what to do with it. Toronto, as an example, wanted to get rid of it because they have all this taxi licensing and they're making a lot of revenues from it. And now you got this other thing that is coming in and the taxi drivers are losing business and they're gonna lose their taxation dollars. And so of course they wanted to get rid of it. Uh, but then there's a, a quick outcry by all these students, all these people like myself that have used it that don't want it to go. So it's too late. The, basically, the barn gate has been held open and everything is out. Uh, you're not going to be able to rally that back in. The best they can do is enact some laws and other taxations and protections in place, but they're not going to be able to easily stop it. Some cities have fought it, like London and Vancouver, uh, but at the end of the day, it's still in those um, cities now. So... Uh, change happens pretty quick. That would be my um, first avenue. Same thing with, you know, uh, Blockbuster and Netflix. Uh, basically, when my kids were kids, my, my uh, younger daughter worked at Blockbuster and you always had to bring back movies. Who wants to bring back movies, right? Like, it's so archaic uh, and you pay late fees and everything else. Well, Netflix came along and there was none of that. And uh, really, it... it it really sort of took over the sector. In fact, Blockbuster had an opportunity in the early days to buy Netflix and they never did um, because they were too happy with what they were doing and they didn't see any value in it. Big mistake. Where's Blockbuster today? Gone. Um, 
maps. Every construction worker always had uh, a map book in their truck. We, we used to call them Pearlies because they were the company that made them. And of course, well, the only problem with that, especially in construction, you're building new subdivisions, you're building new streets, is every year they come become outdated. Uh, so then GPS has started to take hold, but the technology changed so fast that why would I want a GPS if I can use my cell phone? And a lot of the problems with a lot of the GPSs initially is that you had to update them every two or three years with new maps, and that usually was an extra fee. Whereas your cell phone is updated pretty much daily, uh, so you're current, and it can even tell you what the, the traffic patterns are. Of course, now GPSs can too, but um, they're they're kind of a fading business when you consider it to the other technologies that are in place because they're so much quicker to advance and to change and to adjust. So, you know, you can sort of see where this is going. Uh, as a company, uh, and I may have mentioned this before, but in different uh, videos, it, Kodak, uh, we used to do millions of dollars as a company uh, with Kodak. And I would have thought that company would never go bankrupt, had about 150,000 employees worldwide. A uh, huge um, sort of a manufacturing center in a lot of cities globally, including Toronto. Uh, and they invented the first digital camera, but they didn't really invest in it. They were making too much money in film and they kind of were uh, not focused in that sector. And they went into bankruptcy. I think they came out of bankruptcy. They're still an entity, but they're not the Kodak of... Um, uh, the 1800s and the early 1900s and the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, um, different uh, business, right? Uh, so a lot of not responding to change and not being adept and agile with how things are changing can cause a lot of systemic problems in businesses, not just manufacturing businesses, in construction businesses as well. And so today um, you'll see that uh, the, the yards where Kodak was is now partly being uh, made into a um, LRT yard. And this building, which I actually used to do work in uh, at one time, uh, is being relocated and now it's becoming a station for a new LRT. So it's being repurposed and rebuilt and redone and the brownfields being cleaned up, etc on that site. So um, if you don't innovate, uh, you um, actually create your own demise. Uh, not doing anything is, is very often can be detrimental to a business and to individuals from a learning process. Have to learn how things are changing, have to be um, sense, feel, be forward looking, be rear looking and be present looking. There's a number of ways that we have to be agile with these elements. Another business we did a ton of work with was Kmart. Great business to do construction work for. Great company to work for that way. We used to enjoy doing these projects. Uh, they would have um, renovations that they would do and they would be all cost plus. Uh, and you had to go in in the evenings, but that was fine because they were pretty good um, with paying for it, etc. Uh, Sears recently closed not too long ago. Um, Walmart really outdid um, all of them with their logistics uh, and um, their pricing systems. Uh, so they really took a old model and revitalized it and delivered it in a different way. But you know what? If Walmart's not careful, um, they've got to watch out. World is changing. Amazon really is um, advancing in a lot of ways. And at some point and someday, Amazon better be careful. Uh, so you get the idea where this goes. Nobody is safe and you have to be pretty um, responsive to things that are going on in your environment so that you can make improvements. Where does this tie with cost control? What's going on in our project? Where are we not working efficiently? Where can we add more value? And these are things that we have to be thinking about. And you as an individual, when you start your careers in construction or if you're in construction, uh, the more value that you can add to your employer or to your business, or if it is your business uh, and your employees can add value to that, the more successful the business will be, the more successful you will be as an individual, the more you'll have raving fans 
as clients. And that's very, very important. So cost control feeds into this in a big way. Um, so one of the things uh, or some of the things that we should think about is change is going to happen more quickly than in the past. All right. So in the future, it's going to tend to happen more fast um, than in the past. Look, we've just been through 2020, right? And we had a global pandemic, right? And I remember when it was first starting, uh, you know, the, they were interviewing, you know, some of the research scientists regarding vaccines and how long it was going to take. It's going to take the fastest one ever done was four years. Usually it's 10 years. And my wife was saying to me, that's a long time. That's going to take a really, really long time. And I looked at, at her and I said, it's not going to take that long. As long as they can develop a vaccine like that, it's possible. It's going to happen much more rapidly. Why is that? Well, tradition, you have to look at, well, what's traditional? Well, traditional, you got scientists working on something. If it's not a global pandemic, there's not this huge sense of urgency. It's not being funded by every government in the, on the planet. Um, so there's a ton of money that's flowing into this. If it's a global pandemic, it's very time constrained, very time constrained. And so you want to make sure that you can constrain the time, shorten the time as much as possible. And if that means it's going to cost a lot more money, well, we'll spend $20 billion to save a trillion dollars. That sort of thought process. I mean, my numbers are off a little bit, but not really. When you consider shutting things down, that sort of thing, it has a big impact. So um, really things are changing. So now we've got a vaccine and it's less than a year. I actually wrote it down in my... Um, in my journal in the back, I said that there would be a working vaccine by the end of February 2021. Even I was wrong. It was shorter than that. Um, now, getting the supply chains up and running and getting all of those things, it's going to take a few months. But you watch, it'll be a slow start and then you're going to see that it's going to really ramp up. Um, so these are some of the things we wouldn't be able to do that kind of uh, rapid innovation that quickly. Um, three or four hundred years ago. Today we can do things much quicker and things do happen much more quickly. Sometimes maybe because we, we've got a different viewpoint on the world, not as quickly as we still would like, but compared to history, um, much more quickly. So it's going to happen more quickly than in the past. You can potentially be obsolete much more quickly. There's, a down, there's upsides and there's downsides to everything. And so that can be an upside in the case of a vaccine. It can definitely be a downside in the case of you've developed this skill set and all of a sudden what this skill set is in is changing and people aren't going to require it that way anymore. They're going to require it this way. Well, you've got to be more uh, uh, adaptable that you can change over to this new um, methodology. So that's tying into where we're going with this is the ability to learn to learn. You want to be in the upper... 20% of your field, all right? 80% of the success and wealth in that, and really it's, it's, it's even skewed more, um, will go to the upper 20% in their various fields, uh, right? You always hear the 1%, but really, if we're looking at an environment of success, usually it does fall in that 20 to 80% um, zone, which is Pareto's law. And we'll look at uh, Pareto's law in this course a little bit as we go along as well. Um, so you have that 2080 uh, principle and you want to be in that 20%. You know what? Most people don't put ongoing effort and don't respond to change and don't really focus in on the learn to learn aspect. So don't think that you have to be especially ta naturally talented or gifted. Really what it means is building systems, routines and habits that are going to help you improve and you don't have to improve like overnight but if you have those systems and routines and habits it's amazing what you can do over a series of weeks and months and then that eventually does turn into years where somebody that's kind of just reached a certain point and stopped learning you're going to surpass them it's that old sort of um, turtle and the, the rabbit story um, stay, so that's the aspect of understanding and staying current in your field and attuned to change. And again, tying to our course, cost control, understanding what's going on. Where are the costs? Where are the opportunities? Where can we make and implement savings? 
and what's the process in doing that? And do we have certain control systems in place that are going to help us or enable us to better understand what's going on? And the world is becoming much more data oriented. So construction as well is becoming more data oriented. So understanding and interpreting the data in the right way becomes more important. Um, so really uh, having that uh, awareness and being able to look at the tools uh, that you can utilize and focus on that aspect of becoming a lifelong learner, seizing opportunities uh, to scratch your own itch, if you will, uh, where you can improve yourself and um, better yourself. And every business has to think about those things in those terms in how they can be resilient and adaptable to change. So um, those are some of the areas. And if, if we're doing that, then as an individual, but as a business, we are going to continue to improve. And that's going to more likely lead us to being sustainable as a business or being sustainable as an individual in being able to earn a good living throughout our careers. So a few tips on uh, learning uh, that I thought I would uh, throw out there before we really sort of dive into, um, start to dive into this course uh, are really, you know, things of regarding how do we learn um, more uh, effectively. And so really, um, as we said, you know, we've got a number of changes that have happened since the early 1900s that I've kind of already uh, mentioned. Um, and we can look at, well, any prediction on changes to the construction industry that we can think about. Building information modeling, sort of the um, pulling together of all the information that's involved in a project uh, where you really have a database of information the as-built database 6D in BIM, building information modeling, where you have a client purchasing all that data so that they can more effectively manage their buildings in the future, so they can do future uh, repairs and renovations and know what, uh, what was actually done in their building. So the as-built data becomes much more relevant and better to utilize. In planning our projects, we can run through different building scenarios using 3 and 4D uh, in the planning processes to schedule potential ways and methodologies of building the project and have a more realistic or predictable methodology to ensure that we have priced things the way that we expect to do things. And that again ties in with 5D of BIM, building information modeling. So there's a lot of changes that are going to happen in construction. I also see a lot more prefabrication coming into construction where uh, because we have such accuracy in our models that we can order more things to be done outside the project, thus shortening the assembly time in the project. On the positive side with all of this, it does mean that it requires a lot more better and effective management and coordination. Um, so where it might mean that some trades might witness some uh, dwindling of work because some of that work is going to be done in factories uh, and the work done on site will be shortened somewhat. Uh, as far as management and coordination, it requires more effort in those areas and more efficiencies in those areas. So there's there's opportunities for us all um, there. Uh, I kind of like this uh, uh, graph that I took from, it's a, a book uh, called Thank You for Being Late by Thomas Friedman, excellent book. Uh, highly recommend it because it kind of looks at how the world is changing in a multitude of ways. Thomas Friedman's written a number of books on um, basically the world is flat, um, um, hot, flat, and crowded, you know, climate change, different aspects. And he kind of brings this, all of these things together in, in this book. And he, he interviewed Astro Teller, who is, um, you know, our, I think he, at the time anyways, uh, he was the head of artificial intelligence at Alphabet Group or Google. And uh, he sort of said this, the rate of change, one of the things that we're having is this rate of change in human adaptability is changing faster than we can adapt. And so learning faster and governing smarter becomes a big issue because it's like my traffic light example. Um, you know, if things are changing so rapidly, we don't have the infrastructure or laws or 
regulations around governing those things. Also, as individuals, it means we have to be more adaptable. We have to learn to learn faster. In other words, we have to develop effective habits for learning. And this is one of the reasons I'm talking about this is because this is our online course and you're doing a lot of online courses, you're finishing out maybe your program, whatever you're doing, because typically cost control is uh, in the upper levels. Um, but when you're done, you're not gonna be done. You're gonna have to learn a lot of other things. So you might as well start trying to build in the habits and systems of your own learning processes so you can be more effectively. So as I mentioned earlier, to be in that top 20%, really it means spending some time in developing some good, effective learning habits that will make you better than most. And as I said, it's not gonna be most people that do that. And so that's, if you actually just adopt those, some of these habits and systems in learning, you're gonna be much better than most at adapting. So, you know, some learning tips that I would say going through uh, courses, uh, you know, there's, there's the aspect that you can take and a lot of students take it. I'm very well aware of it. And you know what, when I was younger, I kind of fell into that too, is I just need to pass this test. I don't really care what I learn. I just need to pass this test or I need to get an A in this test. Some, some different people are driven different ways. Some people are driven, I just need to, get a pass, I'll call it a, a minimalist um, sort of view. And you know what, minimalist view, I'm not, I'm not taking anything away. Maybe it's a minimalist view because you've got a spouse, you've got kids, you're doing a job, you're trying to do school at the same time and you wanna get this accreditation, right? So this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do to get there. And that's still gonna require some really effective learning habits because your amount of time is like, like this, right? So that's where this can help as well, because you don't want to be spending hours and hours if it's not going to be uh, utilized. And then there's the ones that want to have just an A plus and they don't really even care if they learn stuff and they just sort of cram before. Uh, and, um, and they're fairly talented. Some people are pretty talented that they pick up on things a little bit quicker uh, than others. But you know what, then they kind of forget it after about three or four days or a week. And then it's really not helping them that much in their careers. And then there's those that kind of just are a little bit more methodical and really looking at, they're not so, I gotta have an A, but they just wanna leave the course feeling that they know this material and that they can apply it in the real world. And so wherever you are in the spectrum, I really believe that um, developing effective uh, learning habits um, will help you. And personally, I think the best, most effective way of learning stuff is to take a genuine interest in it, have a genuine curiosity about it and reframe it and enjoy the journey instead of just looking at the outcome. I need to have the diploma. I need to, you know, X, Y, Z. And if you enjoy the process, then it kind of becomes easier to do. You're more passionate about it. And you know what, then the outcome is better and your job is better and you advance more quickly. And then you develop that sort of passion for learning and you learn more through your career. Um, so definitely test yourself, develop. Uh, I think it's it's not a bad thing when you've been uh, doing work on things to even develop your own questions, you know, ask questions and see if you can answer those questions the next day, the next week, the next month, uh, because you forget, you know, you might be able to look at something or I might do something in a class and an hour later, you might be able to answer it, but can you answer it tomorrow? Can you answer it in a week from now? Can you answer it in a month from now? How long we retain things? Um, is important. And so you really have to sort of trick your brain by multiple, hitting it multiple ways uh, with the same type of information so that the brain actually retains it. Um, and so that's why, um, you know, uh, often uh, it, testing yourself is very important. And mixing up questions from different lectures is also important. If you always just study in the exact order that you learn the material, uh, then on a test, if the questions are scrambled up, it can become a little bit disorienting too. Um, so that's helpful in that way. And uh, tests are a great way to learn. Tests are a great way to learn. Uh, quizzes, uh, that sort of thing, they're a great way to learn. Especially if you um, later on look at the questions and try to figure out where you went wrong or um, what were some of the, the weaknesses in those areas, that can be giving you really good sort of feedback um, that way. And, um, you know, if sometimes the material seems like it's overwhelming, take smaller chunks, 
and work on those chunks. There's some really good techniques that you can use for time management, like the Pomodoro timer, where you sort of study for 30 minutes and then you take a break. All right. Everybody's different ranges. They say around 20 minutes to 40 minutes is a pretty good range, depending on the individual. Um, 25 minutes seems to be a, a magic number with the Pomodoro. I usually 30 to 40 minutes myself. Um, but uh, you study something and then you get up and you walk around a little bit. You freshen yourself up a little bit. You don't check email or other stuff during that 25, 30 minutes. If you want to at, after the 30 minutes, do a quick check, you do it then. Uh, you have to remember that all of our devices are designed to get our attention. And so that means it's shortened everybody's ability to focus. We are all sort of focus deprived. We have difficulty focusing for long periods of time on anything, probably more so than any time in history because of all these um, distractions that we have. So we have to learn how to manage that um, better. It's much better to spread it out, all right? Spread it out. I had a student one time, I've studied the last 48 hours straight. And I said, well, that's your problem. For number one, I don't believe he'd studied 48 hours straight, but at any rate, that still would be a problem. You could probably study, if that was the case, you could have probably had retained information 10 times better with half as much studying. You know, if you studied for an hour or an hour and a half every day for the last 12 or 13 days, you'd be way better off than if you just studied 48 hours straight. Um, and you're going to forget everything after the test when you did it 40 hours straight. Whereas you've done it and spread it over time, you retain it. And that means you can apply it in the real world or you can apply it in more advanced courses without having to try to relearn everything. Um, so the other thing is to read something and look away and try to recall what you just read. So you read something and it's a concept, maybe just look away and try to recall what that was. Because all of us, sometimes we start reading things and then we start thinking about other things, right? And you read 10 pages, but you can't remember any of it. Well, that process of stopping and trying to recall it really helps it burn itself in the neurons of the brain. And if you can't recall it, it gives you an opportunity to go quickly back and try to figure out what you were missing about that um, concept. All right. So um, as I also say, 25 minutes, I mentioned Barbara Oakley. She's got a, a, a MOOC, Massive Open Online course on learning how to learn. It's a free course online through Coursera. Uh, you, it really teaches you how to learn to learn, some of the techniques that you need to um, do um, to learn more effectively. I think that's probably one of the biggest investments in somebody's time, and it should be something that they have in high school and grade school. I shouldn't have to be discussing this sort of thing uh, to a more advanced class, but it is necessary because it's not really discussed that much, and it is important, and it will lead you to more success. So. Um, as I said, uh, mixing things up, not necessarily doing them in order can be very, very helpful. If uh, you mix up, uh, if it's a book or if it's lectures or video lectures, whatever it may be in your online processes, um, mix things up. And once you've read through them once, you know, when you go back to study, check in different areas and jump around a little bit. Get used to things coming in different, in different orders so that you can pull things together better. You're more better equipped, right? It's like if you're in a sport, if you only ever do drills a certain way, like hockey, and then you never actually sort of get used to people passing from different directions and that sort of thing and mixing it up in a game type environment or practice, when you get hit the real game, uh, it's going to seem very foreign to you because it's not going to be exactly like your drills, right? So you wouldn't do that. Uh, it's not that you'd never do drills, but it's just you want to mix things up as well. So uh, also try to think about how, how can I make something complex and make it seem simpler? This is something that I work on all the time because I'm a, I'm a professor. I have to try to figure out, you know, there's some people that can take something that's simple and make it seem like it's really complex. I try to take something that's complex and make it seem that it's simple without losing the sense of complexity that can be involved in it, right? Um, I don't want to make uh, shove things off very lightly, but at the same time, why would you want to make it more complex than necessary? I'm reading some 
a book or article and it's got this word and I'm looking it up uh, in the dictionary and I'm like, oh, could have just used this word instead. It's so much simpler, so much more readily understood. It's the author's trying to make something more complicated than it is. Um, so that's not what you want to do, right? And if you can explain it like you had to explain it to somebody that's maybe in grade six or grade five or grade four, and you can explain it to them and simplify it enough that they understand it, then that means you really understand the concepts. Um, so yes, uh, and you know what? If it's something that's very complex, you might want to tackle that before you get too tired. And then if it's something that's a little bit easier, you can um, do that work later on. So something that's maybe in your 20% level of complexity, uh, as opposed to the 80% of ease, uh, you might want to tackle first. And then when, you've, when you're a little bit more tired, you can do the other work that's a little bit more, doesn't require as much focus because you only have so much um, available. Uh, okay, so these are some of uh, the points that, that I would um, say. And of course, um, reframing uh, learning that it is uh, something that is challenging when you're doing it. Like real learning is challenging. It's not the easiest thing, but it's really rewarding too. And understanding and congratulating yourself when you've done something or you've really sort of understood something, give yourself a high five on that because it, it does help to resonate and build those habits. And don't beat yourself up on these things. You know, if you fail an assignment, you fail a, a course, whatever, that's fine. It's a learning process. What can I take out of this? And what can I do the next time that will make me better at it? If there's anybody around that says they've never failed at anything, they're lying, all right? Uh, they might not have failed a course, but they failed at other things in other ways. Trust me. So some of the uh, research that I've sort of quoted from some of these things, for those that of you, you that want to follow up on this in more depth, Peak, How to Master Almost Anything by Anders Ericsson. Uh, he recently passed away, but he was the world's most renowned person on um, really uh, deliberate practice. He sort of came up with the whole concept of the 10,000 hour rule that Malcolm Gladwell kind of made famous, you know, 10,000 hours and you become a, a master at a particular craft. And he corrected uh, on that and really sort of focused on it. It's not just 10,000 hours. And this is where I buy in 100%. It's 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, a practice of doing something with the focus of trying to get better at something. That's where you're going to get really, really good. I know a lot of tradespeople. I know a lot of project managers that have definitely worked 10,000 hours, but they're not really good. And then I know some that have barely worked 10,000 hours that are just excellent. And they didn't necessarily start off great. It's not all about talent. Talent is important, but it's people that have more talent than others but the other ones do deliberate practice and the talented ones don't, will pass the talented ones. Uh, so there's a lot of um, research on that too. So don't think because you don't have this natural talent that you can't um, be better than somebody that is. That's not true. Now, somebody that's got super talent that also puts deliberate practice in, that's gonna be the, the Wayne Gretzky's of the world. Um, but uh, generally speaking, it's, it's a big, big asset to recognize the um, time effect that putting deliberate practice. And deliberate practice means focused hard work, looking for feedback, getting the right mentors that'll give you feedback, and then taking that and adjusting whatever you're doing and slowly incrementally over time getting better. That is what deliberate practice is. And Basically, that's what his research talks about. I already mentioned Barbara Oakley. Um, lots of YouTube videos on all of these people, by the way. If you Google them, you can get more information on, on particularly um, these three. Uh, Deep Work, Cal Newport. That's all of, he's really, um, well, he, he's a, a professor. It's got done a lot of research in this area. Um, Deep Work is really focused and it's really sort of, that was one of his books, Digital Minimalism is another, because, you know, if you're stuck on social media all the time, you're not going to be able to learn in-depth stuff, stuff that will secure your career. 
the easy stuff, the superficial stuff, that's where automation will take it first. It's the more com complicated things like project management, which is complicated and requires a lot of moving balls to be coordinated. Uh, that is more difficult to replace. And if you get really good at those skill sets, you can do deep work and you can become following these other practices at the top of your field. So, you know, if you've hung on this time, if you've read these slides up to this point, if you've listened, um, then I think that's also showing you have the necessary qualities of grit and perseverance. Grit, uh, Angela Duckworth did a lot of research on grit. And that really is what I was talking about earlier, that talent counts once and effort counts twice. And so that's where the effort, the deliberate practice, the focus, the studying um, helps. And building in the habits and systems will also help to set up your successful future. So you're going to see how these things play into the other lectures in cost control. But of course, these things play into everything. So I'm hoping that you've made it this far uh, and uh, congratulate yourself if you did and you reached it to the end of this. Um, that would be great. And I wish you uh, the best in this course and we'll go through this journey together. So I'm Tom Stevenson, uh, wishing you a wonderful day and signing off for now. We'll see you next time. Oh, by the way, you might wanna check, I'm gonna be providing, um, uh, well, if you actually uh, click the subscribe, I should set, I'm gonna set up a playlist so that you can see the listing of the videos in this course so it's more easy for you to access. Okay, bye for now.